There are countless conspiracy theories circulating around social media. Just look for a few minutes and you'll hear that 9-11 was actually perpetrated by the US government, that the coronavirus pandemic is all just a hoax, or that Hillary Clinton was running a child sex trafficking ring out of a pizza shop. For most of us, we see that these conspiracy theories are just insane. But can we actually make that case with math and with data? Thanks to some work by a researcher at Oxford University, it turns out we can. Welcome to Data Demystified, I'm Jeff Gallick, and in this episode, we'll look at the math of why conspiracies like the one I mentioned before are just incredibly unlikely to be real. Now, to be clear, there are some conspiracies that are, or at least were, real. Watergate was a conspiracy to cover up illegal behavior by then-President Richard Nixon. The Tuskegee Syphilis Conspiracy was an attempt by the US Public Health Service to cover up experimentation on African American men. And the NSA's prison program was a conspiracy to conceal how much spying was done by the US government on its own citizens. But we know about those conspiracies because of one of two reasons. For Watergate, it was in large part the incompetence of a group of burglars that led to the eventual break in the conspiracy. And for both the Tuskegee conspiracy and the NSA prison conspiracy, it was a whistleblower who broke things wide open. Dr. Peter Buxton exposed the Tuskegee experiments in 1972, and Edward Snowden exposed the PRISM conspiracy in 2013. The point is that whenever you have conspiracies, even massive ones, and maybe even especially massive ones, they seem to fall apart, either due to incompetence, like with Watergate, or to whistleblowers, like with Tuskegee and PRISM. But just how likely is that to happen? That's where the math comes in. Now, there's a lot of complex math in this paper showing that conspiracies just don't work if they get big enough, but I'm going to simplify things to make them clearer for you. In fact, let's start with a really simple and unrealistic example, and then build on that to get to something more realistic. Let's imagine we have a conspiracy that only involves two people. They are working together to hide a secret from the public. Well, as much as they try, there is some chance that they will either mess up and leak information, or that their conscience will get the better of them and they'll spill the beans. We have no way of knowing how likely that is, but let's, just for the sake of this example, assume that it's 50%. As in, there's a 50% chance that either of them will reveal the conspiracy one way or another. Yes, I know that this is likely way too high, but we'll go with it for now and then we'll make it realistic in a bit. Anyway, to be clear, it only takes one person to reveal a conspiracy, so we can compute how likely the whole conspiracy is to fall apart given the information we have here. We can do that by building a really simple table like this one. Here we write out all the possibilities that could happen, and there are four of them. A stays quiet and so does B. A stays quiet but B blows it. A blows it but B stays quiet, and they both blow it. What's important is that if either of them blow it, the whole conspiracy unravels. So we can count how many times that happens. In this case, that happens three out of four times. So the likelihood that this conspiracy is blown is actually 75%. Well, what if we had a third person? The short version is that now we have to have all three people stay quiet, which is even less likely to happen. Here's a table showing all those possibilities. As you can see that in only one of eight cases does the conspiracy hold up, which translates to a failure rate of 87.5%. But what's even crazier is that this is actually an underestimate because we're only considering this for a single point in time. Instead, let's change this to say that each person is likely to blow it with a probability of 50%, but that's the probability of blowing it each week. So every week, they get another chance to blow it. If we go back to the simple case of just two people and assume two weeks go by, we can now expand this table to include both weeks one and week two. But remember that the only way we even get to week two is if both people stayed quiet in the first week. So now on week one, there was a 75% chance of blowing it, and on week two, there's again a 75% chance of blowing it. But we only get to week two 25% of the time. The way we compute this is to just multiply those two together. So 75% times 25% is 18.75%. So we add that to the original 75%, and we now get that after just two weeks, the likelihood of anyone blowing it at any point is 93.75%. If we repeat this for another week, the number goes up to 98.44%, and another week gets us to 99.61%. In other words, it becomes a near certainty that this conspiracy will fail. But of course, setting the likelihood of someone blowing a conspiracy at 50% is nuts. Presumably people involved in a real conspiracy have a lot of incentive not to blow it. 
So let's redo all this with a few other guesses at how likely people are to blow it. Rather than make that table again, I'm going to graph the likelihood that a conspiracy blows up first depending on how many people are involved, and then by how long the conspiracy lasts. And I'll do that for three values, 1%, 0.1%, and 0.01%. To give you a sense of this, 0.01% is a little bit less than the odds of picking the right number on a roulette wheel twice in a row. So let's see what this looks like. This graph has the probability of the conspiracy blowing up on the vertical axis, and the number of people involved in the conspiracy on the horizontal axis. I'm plotting this from 0 to 50,000 people. Now, that might seem like a lot, but remember that one conspiracy theory is that the moon landing was a hoax, and well over 400,000 people were involved in the space program. If it really were a conspiracy, every single one of them would have to stay quiet. The point is that 50,000 seems like a lot, but many of these conspiracy theories involve many, many more people. Anyway, let's see what this looks like if we assume that the odds of any one person leaking is 1%. Well, in that case, even the smallest conspiracies fall apart almost immediately. You'd only need 500 people to get well over 99% likelihood of a conspiracy falling apart. So let's drop that number to 0.1%. Now it takes about 4,600 people to get to that same 99% threshold. And if we drop it further still to 0.01%, it would take nearly 46,000 people to get to a 99% chance that the conspiracy would fall apart. But remember, this is just the odds for one time period, one week in our example. So let's see what happens when we introduce time. But before we do that, if you could take a moment to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new content that I put out, I'd really appreciate it. With that said, let's further debunk conspiracy theories with math. This is now going to be the same graph as before, but instead of assuming just one week of time has passed, like you see now, I'll assume two weeks have passed. Well, now the odds shift quite a bit. Focusing on that 0.01% case, it now only takes 23,000 people for the conspiracy to blow up with 99% certainty. What about after three weeks? Now we're down to just 15,000 people. Well, let's fast forward to 52 weeks or one year of a conspiracy being around. It would now only take 900 people for the conspiracy to blow up after a year. After five years, it would take less than 200 people to nearly guarantee that a conspiracy would blow up. The point of all this is twofold. First, as we saw in that first graph, as conspiracies get bigger, the likelihood that everyone keeps it a secret just falls apart dramatically. And second, even with relatively small conspiracies of just a few hundred people, with enough time, they will also fall apart. So can conspiracies exist? Sure. But is it much more likely that conspiracy theories involving thousands or hundreds of thousands of people are just stories we sometimes tell to validate a narrative we want to support? You bet. And if you want to dig into the math a bit more to see just how unlikely these conspiracy theories are, I suggest reading the original research on this topic, which I'll make sure to link to below. So the next time you hear about a conspiracy theory, Ask yourself, how many people are likely involved? In the most elaborate ones that I've heard, that number is often huge. And if that's the case, reflect back on the math we saw here to see just how far-fetched those theories are. Finally, as always, thanks so much for watching.